space may be the final frontier, but boldly going there costs billions of dollars. We'll examine the financial future of taking another giant leap. I'm Shuli Ghosh. This is Insight. Hello there and welcome to the program. The space race that put a man on the moon cost around $110 billion in today's money. In the mid-1960s, America was spending more than 4% of its national budget on the space program. Now, NASA has no rockets. It relies on Russia to get people into orbit and it has done a deal with two private companies to develop the next generation of spacecraft. In this program, we'll examine the future of space exploration and ask, if we do boldly go, who's going to pick up the bill? Insight's Dana Lewis reports. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. In the 1960s, space exploration is a race between America and Russia for dominance of Earth and beyond. That's one small step for man, one in the coming decades, America will bankroll an expensive shuttle program, which ultimately has tragic failures, and space exploration becomes too expensive. And lift off, the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. By 2011, shuttles are grounded. Ironically, NASA has to pay Russia for American astronauts to ride Soyuz capsules to the space station. I think that was the moment when a lot of people in the states realized that, you know, the way we've been doing our space program by almost locking out the private sector is wrong. It's not the way we do things. And lift off. The Falcon takes flight. Enter the dot-com billionaires and a new way to ride. Ride a rocket, that is. Beautiful asset. SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, who sold PayPal and started making electric cars and Falcon launch vehicles. He gets paid on cargo deliveries to the space station and has his sights set on setting up the first human colony on Mars by 2022. His dream to make tickets one day cost about $100,000 each for the 180-day journey. The key is making this affordable to uh, almost anyone who wants to go. Here it is. Jeff Bezos is another space entrepreneur. He's founded Amazon and is behind Blue Origin and Orbital Rockets. For both companies, returnable, reusable rockets is a key advancement in exploration and minimizing expense. NASA has just become another customer. Zero. Jeffrey Manber runs a commercial space company called NanoRacks. Five NanoRacks, we have good deploy. NanoRacks leases out lab space on board the International Space Station and uses the station to run experiments and even launch satellites. The space station has become a business platform. We offer NanoRacks a commercial pathway. Uh, so what that means is we were the first company uh, to take the leap, uh, the leap of faith, and we invested in and own our own research hardware on the space station, and we get to market it to whom we wish. So we own microscopes, centrifuges, research platforms. Uh, we have our own satellite deployers. Uh, we've uh, launched over 150, I think it is, small satellites from the space station. And we went forward and we've created this market. And that's the private sector. And that's what we do best uh, in the United States. Commercialization of all space sectors is estimated to be worth more than $50 billion annually. And you have to have nerves of steel to be one of those who try. SpaceX has lost satellites and rockets. Virgin, which has invested in space tourism, has lost a spaceship and tragically a test pilot. But Richard Branson hasn't blinked. That purpose, which drives me and our team, and which unites us with our partners and our friends is the belief that together we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. 
Just outside of London, we visited Airbus Defense and Space, one of the older traditional companies churning out $100 million satellites for private and government missions. They're also working on a rover for the 2021 rendezvous with Mars. Airbus's space arm survives with commercial and government contracts. Private enterprise is actually building these things anyway. Even when we're thinking about institutional, government-funded programs, it's industry that actually does the work, largely. How does Airbus see the new entrepreneurs next to them on the launch pad? The leaders of some of those companies clearly have a passion. That's why they've got into it. Um, so it's a really exciting time. It's been a game changer. Um, players like us in industry have new opportunities to build systems unlike things that we've built before. Uh, today, I, again, I cannot tell you whether they will be successful in the, in the long run, but it's very interesting to be going along for that journey. Are they your competitors? Um, no, they're potentially our customers. Making the final frontier profitable is just in its infancy. It's not just about taking rich people for space adventures. It's about making space vehicles, satellites, science platforms more accessible to industry and people. It's happening right now, and the possibilities are infinite. From Airbus's seven-ton satellites to this. So what we've got here is the smallest satellite in the world. It's something we use really to help people understand what it takes to build satellites. In the UK, the government is funding what's called Catapult, a program to teach business how they can use space to improve their bottom line. And the applications of space are nothing less than out of this world. Satellites now track fishing vessels. Illegal fishing can be spotted. And more than that, what a ship catches where and when can be transmitted to food companies, even shoppers, to understand the catch was fresh and taken from the right place. Other satellites can be used for city planners. So if you look here, this you one shows images of farming today. field by field and can show a farmer one part of his field is growing slower than another and needs attention. The future is, is unbounded in some respects. You can actually imagine some of this technology being put into all different orbits as long as it's appropriately managed. So you could have clust swarms of satellites um, actually going around Mars, for instance, or we go around the planet. It doesn't have to be just for um, assisting in, in living on, on the Earth. Big and small companies are entering the space marketplace, hoping for a piece of huge investments being made. And suddenly, space entrepreneurs are making a profit. It's a living. It's a living. I'm Dana Lewis, reporting for Insight. Well, let's discuss this further. I'm joined now by Ian Crawford, who's a professor of planetary science and astrobiology at Birkbeck College, University of London. And also with us is Sarah Crillas, who's a space journalist and a broadcaster. Good to have you both with us. Hello. Um, you know, for, for decades, we've seen space exploration as being the, the purview of governments. But that's no longer the case, is it? It's opening up to, to everybody. Well, I think what we're seeing is actually what we've seen throughout history in terms of exploration. Governments have naturally gone in first. Um, and now what you're seeing is private companies going in and looking to generate profit, revenue, and to transform an industry. So to compare it, for example, with American history, you could say the Apollo moon landings were the Columbus moment. And now what we're seeing is the Mayflower moment in terms of exploration. So yes, it does seem something new and something different, but it isn't actually. It's just on a different thing. And throughout history, we've gone to a new place. It's often been a one-way trip, exploration throughout history, and we've lived off the land. So some companies are looking at mining, mining asteroids, mining the moon. Sounds like science fiction, but throughout history, we've gone to a new place and lived off the land. So it's just that next natural step in terms of exploration. So the next natural step, but what we've got is NASA has going from spending 4.4% of its federal budget back in the 60s, so less than 0.5% now. So actually, if we want to continue with space exploration, we're going to have to. They're, they're going to have to partner up with private companies. Yes, I think that's true. And I think this is why it's the, so exciting to see this uh, renaissance or this um, tremendous push from, from, the private, from the private sector who are interested in space exploration because governments will not be able to fund it, nor should they really try to fund it all on their own. So I think there's a real opportunity here for a symbiotic, a very strong symbiotic relationship between government space programmes and private industry. And I think, I think together they will, they will get us off this planet. But what you've got are um, credible companies like, like Boeing and Airbus. You've also got smaller companies run by, how would you describe them, rich enthusiasts uh, and entrepreneurs. I mean, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, how, how credible are they? 
Well, I think none of these things are mutually exclusive, right? It's a kind of a, a rising tide raising all ships. So some of these new startups may not make it, some, some of them will. But I think the more actors we have in the game, the better it will be for space exploration generally. So I think it's very exciting. And I think it's a mistake to see these things as mutually exclusive, government or private, tourism versus mining. These are not mutually exclusive. There's room for all of these actors. I mean, the universe is a very big place, so there's room for all of us to, to explore. And I, I'm sorry, and I would add that in terms of exploration, um, it's always been the people who were laughed at throughout history who actually were proved right. I mean, you look at um, all the ideas that we thought of which seemed impossible, they do eventually come true. So, yes, the Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic, there has been setbacks, there has been negativity from the media, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen and we need people to think big, we need these dreamers to actually push forward ideas and to drive forward well, exploration. I suppose the first um, ship's captains who said they were going to sail round the world yeah, exactly. were, were the same reaction for them. Or the first person who said the world was round instead of flat. Uh, indeed. Uh, a lot of what we're hearing about today uh, isn't uh, about mining or um, new technology. It's about putting people into space, space tourists. No, I, I think a lot of what the layperson and the media is hearing is about putting people into space. But actually, it's about using space to transform life here on Earth. I mean, we went into space to improve life here on Earth. And there's two different branches. You've got NASA looking at missions to Europa, a frozen moon around Jupiter, where we think there may likely be life. We've got, you know, we've just sent a probe to Pluto. The Rosetta mission's um, coming to an end. We've got all these exciting robotic missions, but then also we've got private missions where we're looking at improving satellite technology, selling software. I mean, what's worth more, your smartphone or the actual software within the smartphone? And that's the same thing we're probably going to say with the space industry. You'll push forward the type of hardware you've got, but it's the software and the actual development and the data which will drive forward business and innovation and actually allow money to be made out of this industry. So the, the whole, the space race back in the 60s between the US and Russia, that grew out of the Cold War. So now, and now it, is it, is there a secondary war going on? Is it a, a no. commercial war? I mean, there's billions of dollars to so, be made So out. I think, I think it's, this is slight, slightly simplistic. So the, the original space race was a geopolitical competition between two superpowers. What's going on now is that space exploration is still, it's that, that big Cold War competition has gone away, but there are still very strong reasons for wanting to explore space, right? There are still very strong scientific reasons, there are still very strong economic reasons, industrial reasons, inspirational reasons, and I would even argue there are geopolitical reasons as well, it's just the geopolitical reasons are different, and that space can be used to help uh, forge links between countries and cooperation between countries rather than competition. So that's As a, we saw with the International well, Space Well, absolutely, Station. so 15 countries, or 16 now, I think, on cooperating on the space station. So this is, and it, and it survived through all, all sorts of other global crises and it provides a way of linking linking nations together so so I think this is a, a you know there are sort of these multiple like reasons and part of this is government led and part of it will be private led and I think we should you know welcome that it's not it's, oh, it's I was not quite an either or thing to, to, to learn that something like uh, 70 countries claim to have a space program so even though you, you've got the US sort of looking more at, at, at private partnership, a lot of countries like China and India. Well, China's a fascinating example because you think when man landed on the moon, most people in China weren't even aware of the moon landings. They were living under the Mao regime. And now China, they have a robotic lander on the moon. They're looking at landing something on the far side of the moon, which has never been done before. They're looking at plans for a space station. They're really, uh, in a way, they've got this quite secretive space program. But it's not just about America and Russia anymore. The world's moved on. And space is for everyone. And space is important because humans were built to go over the hill, we were built to explore. So it's just naive to think we're just going to stop doing space. And, and you need people like Elon Musk on top of all the other countries to think, yes, we can do that. And it's, it's driving competition in so many different ways. So successes for China might drive forward um, more innovation uh, and more determination to come from America. Um, so we're really, we are really entering into a new space race. It's called Space 2.0 in the industry. <laughs> space but it is, Race 2.0. Space has finally like become it. exciting again. I mean, there was a bit of a lull after the Apollo landings. The, the shuttle era was kind of exciting, but not as inspirational. But now any kid who graduates from college, from university, instead of going to work for Boeing, they can actually dream of an idea themselves. And just like with um, computers and IT and that kind of technology, that can turn overnight into a business and really disrupt the industry. So it is a hugely exciting time to be in space and to be looking at space exploration. Yeah, you, we shouldn't underestimate this inspirational aspect. 
You know, all, those, all these children out there who would dream of becoming astronauts, even if very few of them will, but if they study engineering or science, this, this will be a tremendous benefit for the whole of society that can, can be driven by space inspiration. Yep. So I actually think it's quite an important driver it, behind it what's is, going on. It is an exciting time, and we will explore that further. You're watching Insight. Coming up, we'll ask who's got the best plan to move mankind to Mars. Stay with us.